BTS friends, how do I set up my classroom? Um, so I have a giant rainbow rug that I inherited from a kindergarten teacher. So I have a rug where I gather all of my kids, especially the lower grades, K through three, to begin with. Um, if you have kids come into your room and just sit down at the desks or the tables, you've already lost them. Their little attention spans just can't deal with it. So I have them gather, they each sit in a little square, and I say to them, okay, here's what we're gonna do and I'll, I'll rattle off a list of instructions. I love to read to elementary students, especially if I can find a storybook that pertains directly to the assignment that we're doing. Um, and that way you've already got them, you've got the hook and they are there with you. And then when you've given them instructions, they can move on to the desks or the tables and they're ready to go. Setting up a classroom, I fortunately have a classroom. There are some of us which are art and cards, so I'm grateful for my classroom. And I have seven tables in my classroom. Each table has a color assigned to it. I have the three primary colors, the three secondary colors, and gray. And each color table um, will occasionally be a helper table. I'll ask like the green table or something to come and help pass out pencils and things kind of to help with the management of passing out supplies. I have a wet area. I train my kids from day one that they go get their water, that they rinse out their brushes. They know how to get out aprons. They know how to uh, get out paints. I teach them how to use paints. So um, the wet area is then their territory and they, they know how to use it correctly. Uh, I also have a, a supply area and I keep markers, uh, colored pencils, watercolor pencils, rulers, anything that you can think of that instead of having to set up for every prep or every different grade, you've got it out and you can say, oh, you know where the crayons are. They're over by the yellow monster in the corner of the room. I have a yellow monster and he sits on top of my supplies. They know exactly where that is and they can walk over and go grab it and get it out. So that saves you time. I really want my classroom space to be the children's space. So I've tried to label closets and things so that students know where the supplies are so that they can go and get, get it themselves because I found really quickly that I spent a lot of my time going and getting supplies for students instead of actually helping them with their ideas and their learning, which is what I was mostly interested in. Must have supplies. You need to have paper. That's the first thing. And um, I really recommend using some of your budget, if you can afford it, to get some decent watercolor paper. Uh, if you've ever tried to paint on garbage paper, you paint a hole right through the center and the kids get really upset and frustrated. Uh, there are good places to get it for relatively inexpensive, um, like even uh, office supply stores have a better paper than, uh, I mean, we can't all afford arches, I would love to do that, but uh, they have better quality paper that you can get for relatively inexpensive. And then, talk to your principal, I have a wall of paper that is all um, construction paper. And then I recycle and I save every scrap of paper within reason. I say if it is bigger than your hand, we got to keep it. We got to hold on to it. We're going to use that for something. I don't know what it is yet, but we will use it. Uh, I ask other teachers, please let me have uh, extra cardstock, extra um, paper that you have. I've, I've had reams of the most bizarre paper brought into me from parents and things like that because they know I'm always collecting it get the word out that you are in desperate need of supplies and they just start showing up. It's really pretty remarkable. One thing that I love is that I only use, at least for tempera and acrylic paint, I only use primary colors, white and black. I feel like that saves money. Um, it forces the students to mix their colors so that when they do a green for their landscape, not everyone's green looks like the exact same. We kind of get this variety of hues. And it's also easier just distribution of paint. I buy the big gallons of paint. I usually buy those from uh, Blick.com. And then I have the little like ketchup pumps on top so students can go over. I have like those little dollar trays with like 10 slots in it and go over and just do one squeeze 
in there. I also use that for glue. I buy the gallon of glue and use those same pumps that you can also buy at Blick. And then they can just squeeze the glue in there. I do not use glue sticks. I don't use little squeeze bottles of glue. I just use the big one. They go over, they squirt it inside of the palette, and then they use a brush to apply it. I just use the Elmer's School glue and that stuff. With hot water, it usually comes off. But I don't usually let them use the nicer brushes for that. I usually have specific brushes for specific things. So in my closet, I have one section for brushes, and I've tried to label the cups. Like, these are good for acrylics. These are good for like anything. You can use this for glue or whatever. This is good for watercolor. I also love oil pastels. Little kids are just overwhelmed and excited that they can press and smear something and it's not a crayon. They are all so familiar with crayons that crayons become kind of boring to them. Uh, so give them something new, something they haven't tried yet. Watercolor pencils are awesome because they can control them. Uh, sometimes you like to paint and make a huge painting mess. Uh, sometimes you need to tight, you need tight compositions and my little kids can't really, when you have uh, weaker fine motor skills, you need uh, watercolor pencils and then they can get those little details in there. Um, I love watercolor paint. Some people really love the wet liquid watercolors. I have a harder time with those, um, but some people swear by them. I say experiment, find what you like, um, write for grants, and um, you will be shocked with how much you can do with very little, very little supplies. I feel like kids can make anything with just a really limited amount of supplies. I feel like if they have cardboard, cardboard's a must-have, scavenge for cardboard. The Promethean board, cardboard is the best. They're like huge sheets. And with that, you probably want like a box cutter, knife, and that works really well to cut the cardboard, string, lots of glue, lots of different adhesives, so tape and glue, hot glue, just things to stick things together. Um, and then lots of knickknacks. I have a junk closet where things from other teachers that I get and I just put it in the closet and students can use that as supplies. Uh, anytime you're gonna use um, temper paints, uh, anything with ink, I ask for, at the beginning of the year, um, old t-shirts. They have to be extra large. Uh, sometimes you need to cut the collar out so that you can uh, get them over their head, especially during the winter when you're wearing bulkier clothing. Um, or you can ask for aprons. A lot of moms have, you know, extra aprons that they don't care about anymore. My intention is to keep as much artwork until the end of the school year and to try and send it home in a portfolio. I know that's not always practical, but my thinking is that the artwork has a better chance of lasting if it comes home in a, in a big bundle of artwork than if they, it comes home individually. If you don't have space, then you can't really help that. And I definitely keep 3D artwork until like an art show. And then after the art show, I usually allow the students to take it home. I have a storage area and I vertically store, I've got the names of every single teacher in my, in my school and then I store the work in the slots. Um, it can be challenging sometimes because you have three dimensional work and I'm really lucky to have a kiln room and I'm really lucky to be super awesome buddies with my janitors and custodians of this school so they will let me put things in, in cubbies and closets. Uh, you have to be innovative. You have to be, um, and you have to go and find places that aren't being used and be willing to negotiate with your custodians. I always say it's a really great idea to make best friends with your custodians and get your drawing racks um, as one of the first things you need as an art teacher is a place to dry wet painting. So walk around your school, see who has one, see if you can borrow it, you know, part time. Uh, and then start thinking about how either talk to your principal, talk to your PTA, write a grant to see if you can get one or two drying racks and it will change your life. Because even if you can leave something on the rack overnight, the next day it'll be dry. And you come in and you can pull it off the stack and then put it in those slots. And, that, and, I, and I do that quite a bit. Art on a cart. I have done it. So I know what you're going through. Um, I would recommend, number one, talking to your principal, getting enough time so that you can change, physically change supplies between 
grade levels or classes. So the number one thing out of the gate, I would ask for a little five minute gap so that your teachers aren't frustrated with you for always being late and that you've got time in case you've forgotten something um, that you can, you can go back and get. That being said, you need to be super organized. And uh, art teachers, that's not our strong point, let's be honest. We are not organizers. But you need to either the night before or the morning of uh, give yourself enough time to lay out the supplies until lunchtime. That's how I used to do it. I'd say, okay, what do I have until lunch? And I would either load it all onto the cart or I would have it in my office or my supply closet so that I could just grab it real quickly in between. Be a really good art teacher. Earn a room for yourself. Once you get into your school, once you've proven what a valuable asset you are to your community, they will give you a place. I promise you. But you have to earn their respect and you have to earn it. Uh, another thing, get, find yourself a closet someplace, in a corner in the boiler room where you can stack um, supplies that no one else will have access to. If you have a big open area like I was on the stage, um, things tend to get lost, migrate. So um, make sure you have a closet where you can actually lock things up, paints, um, paper, uh, brushes, supplies, things like that. You, you at least minimum need a closet to keep things in. What do you do with fast finishers? Sketchbooks. As I mentioned before, each student has a sketchbook, so that's kind of my number one go-to is go and grab your sketchbook and you can free draw. I have some books available that they can practice drawing. Um, one teacher left behind was giving away this like box of like animal cards and so students can go and get an animal card and most of the time they just read the facts, but they can also practice drawing these different animals. Fast finishers, it is the universal problem curse of the art teacher. You have kids that would spend a month on a project if they could. You have kids that would spend five minutes on a project and they will. So I have um, a collection of drawing books so that when my kids are done, they know, oh, I can go over, I can get a piece of paper and I can uh, start practice drawing. Uh, I will tell you how I've collected them. Every, every school year, um, you will have a book fair once or twice. And I, they have wish lists for teachers. And every year, I will go in and I will find the three drawing books that are at the book fair. And parents will get them for me. Um, they're really great about buying books for teachers. And if you, and, and usually they're quite inexpensive. You can even get some of them on Amazon for like three or four dollars a piece. And you don't have to buy the new ones. You can buy the used ones. Be cheap, be frugal. And I've had some of these books for 15 years. So uh, the, the goal is to keep anyone who completes their work really quickly. Uh, and again, you need to say, uh, this isn't a race. Art's not a race. You need to do your best work all the time. Something that you want to take home and be proud of. If you're not willing to hang this on a wall and have uh, the whole school walk by it with your name on it, then you probably need to go work on it a little bit more. But if you are done and you feel good about this, then yeah, sure, go over to the free drawing area and you can get out a piece of paper and you can free draw. So my typical day um, involves basically um, five or even six grade levels. Uh, except for Mondays, I teach six uh, kindergarten classes, which is like herding cats with paintbrushes. But um, so if you are unlucky and you have that many preps, you've got to establish routines with, with your kids. So I actually start out with an assignment. I don't wait and go through a bunch of rules. My kids have been trained. Some of these kids I've had since second grade. So they already know what my rules and expectations are. If you're a brand new teacher, uh, I would recommend at least going through half of your rules. Uh, and then I would recommend establishing any procedure before you give that media out. Uh, kindergarten first, second grade always comes straight to the rainbow carpet and they have a seat. And we talk about what we're going to do that day. I start with the bang. I start with whatever art project we've determined, we've set up, and we are off to the races. The first day of art class is make a sketchbook day. Every student in the school makes a sketchbook. And what I do to make those sketchbooks is I will get Usually the year before, I'll gather old manila folders that teachers are just going to throw away anyways. And then I cut those down to just bigger than half a folded over, eight and a half by 11. So I just use copy paper as the paper. 
and then I use the manila folders as the cover, and then we just use one of those longer staplers to bind it together. And the first day we go over some procedures and some rules, and then we make our sketchbooks and we decorate them. It's just like a really low key day. As far as um, planning what a day looks like, my intention is always at the end of the previous day to get as much things ready for the next day, to get all of the supplies out. But when you have you know, upwards of six, maybe even seven classes a day, it's difficult to get all of the supplies out at one time. So I'll try and get as much out as I can, maybe for two or even three projects. And then at lunchtime, if you have time, which we don't always do, I'll try and switch those things out. Uh, and then clean up. Cleaning is the big deal. Uh, I tell my kids, this is a self-cleaning art room. I am here to help you, but I am not your mom. I have two kids and they're total slobs. So don't make me clean up after you two. So uh, we can't leave my room. In fact, you can't even get up from your table until everything on the floor and on top has been picked up and put away. And that's another one of those procedures, whether you have a table captain that gets and puts supplies away, or you have the vacuum cleaner. They know who they are. Everybody knows who a vacuum cleaner is. They have to go around and pick up all the little pieces off the floor. Or you have the table scrubber, the, um, the bus boy or bus girl who's gonna come and scrub everything off and make it clean. But you're not allowed to get in line until your table has been dealt with. Planning a year uh, is, can seem really intimidating. In my mind, I don't really set out to plan a whole year at once. I kind of have it be this really fluid um, progression of ideas in that I have no idea, even this year, what I'm going to teach in a specific grade at a, you know, in January. I don't know exactly. Sometimes we repeat things to the point where, yeah, I can kind of know, but it's, to me it's really cool to go and meet with the teachers regularly, if possible, and to consult with them, because they're always switching their curriculums as well, and to kind of meet with them and say, hey, what are you learning about this year? And some of them keep on pace uh, year after year, but sometimes you can be like, well, last year we did this thing in science in January. What if we did math this year? And you pull that in and you try and do something a little bit different. Or you take the same science concept and see if you can twist it and make it even better. So I kind of like that we revisit it each year and say, hey, is this something that we want to do again? Do we like it? How can we make it better? Or should we try something new? I think as a human being, you would get really bored if you did the same 10 projects every year. So I, I'm always changing things up. That being said, I have a schedule and I like to plan out at least a month in advance just so that I can anticipate um, supply needs, teacher needs, um, and also negotiate. I, I do a lot of ceramic work. So I have to schedule out the kiln because I share it with 30 other faculty members. So uh, I have to anticipate a few things. If you are just going on a day-to-day, -day, you're going to be frantic and that's going to lead to ulcers and you being a miserable person. So you, you have to plan out. So how do I plan? Well, before the school year starts, I go around to each grade level and they have team meetings constantly. In fact, that's what our Monday we have collaboration time. I know you have an early out time. I don't know what day it is, but you'll, they will have team meetings and I will say, do you have a year layout of what you are doing in science, what you are doing in math, what you are doing in social studies? And then tell me the big projects you're doing in language arts. Are you gonna write a note to your mom for Mother's Day? Are you going to write a, uh, a story on you know, X, Y, Z? And then I will try and talk to them and we will work out some really great projects. At the beginning of the year, um, I had one other Beverly Taylor Sorensen teacher suggest to just do an art for art's sake lesson right at the beginning of the year. Don't try and focus too much on integration just because the teachers are so busy. It's hard to grab them if you can, that's great. And so you can do you know, kind of a more art for art's sake lesson, maybe building some skills and foundations. And then during that time, you can hopefully meet with the grade levels and start to get that integration going throughout the rest of the year. 
and meeting meeting with them regularly is really important. I do a lot of negotiating and collaborating during lunchtime. And I know that sometimes uh, teachers hang out in their little clicky groups and the sixth graders are friends and the, uh, the fourth grade team are friends. But I find that I go a long way showing up to a lunch that's not mine or sitting with a group that's not mine and I can I can get to know people and I can find out what they're doing and what's important to them so even if you don't have that collaboration time built into your schedule it is valuable and important to you to make time also if I feel like painting just because and I'm having that kind of a week then we're gonna paint and so uh, don't beat yourself up if you are not meeting that collaboration goal 100% of the time. That being said, you do need to try. I mean, that's the point of the Beverly Taylor Sorensen program. We are here to collaborate. But if you find that you need to weave or you need to do something that's kind of off to the side and you are just creating art, I had a task party with my sixth grade. Why? Because we wanted to. Don't beat yourself up about it. Do it. Try new things because it will make your job fun for you again. And it also may, it reminds the kids that art isn't just about math and science. Sometimes you just need to make art, so that's okay. I draw a lot upon what other artists are doing, specifically contemporary artists. And so after we kind of select that theme, I scour the internet, art blogs, um, and other places to just collect artists who are doing, working within that theme, whether it's that scientific theme or a mathematical theme, or working you know, with writing or language arts, and I'll kind of collect artists who are just doing really interesting things with that topic. And I may, you know, really mimic what one of those specific artists are doing. Um, I try not to do exactly what they're doing, but just kind of be um, inspired by some of their methods and methodologies. Well, one of my favorite art blogs is called This Is Colossal. Um, it's a really friendly uh, website. It has a little search bar on the side, um, and the author does a really good job of categorizing things and has keywords at the bottom of each of the posts and it's just really creative it not only includes um, fine art but also photography and video and illustration um, and professional contemporary artists where do i get my ideas well i'm not gonna lie pinterest is sort of like the venus flytrap of ideas um, the problem with pinterest is you will walk down the hallway and you will see the same project or variants of it. So uh, uh, my Pinterest board is, I call it seed ideas, because they are not the end. They are an idea that I might take somewhere else or do something different with. So um, look for ideas on Pinterest, it's great, it really is. And there are some awesome links to art bloggers out there, other art teachers. I, I do use it that way as sort of a networking place too because I have found that there are fantastic art teachers and it is Pinterest is a great way to sort of connect with those teachers and then all of a sudden now you're on their blog and now you're emailing them and asking them questions which leads me to where do I another place I get my ideas from other teachers talk to the teachers in your school. They, I promise you they're doing, even your elementary, regular elementary classroom teachers are doing interesting things. Talk to other art teachers in your district. Go find the veteran ones. Um, go to the conventions, go to the state convention, go to the national conventions. There are so many great ideas out there and people are doing it. Go to museums, they all have outreach programs. They all have programs that want kids there and are doing things with them. Another great way to get ideas is through collaboration. And most of the collaboration that I have found is going to professional development opportunities and conferences. And going to those, you just get to work with other art teachers. And yes, I get good ideas from going to some of the presentations and workshops, but a lot of times it's in between the workshops where I get to talk with other teachers and say, hey, what are some cool stuff that you're doing in your classroom? And, you know, kind of borrow some of the ideas that they're doing. The one thing that I've learned uh, at my, as I've taught art for the past 
five years is to trust the students. They have the coolest ideas. They always blow my mind with the cool ideas that they have. So sometimes if you're not sure exactly what a project should look like or what medium it should be, ask the students. And it's a little scary and a little intimidating, but also really cool. We were doing this project in second grade about the weather, and I had that conversation with the second graders about what, what should the medium be for this artwork. And one little second grader raised his hand. He had the most genius idea. He said, well, you know, if someone's doing an artwork about um, the rain, maybe they should use watercolors because it's wet. And maybe if they're doing something when it's sunny, maybe they should use uh, crayons or colored pencils because those are dry. And that's a really, really simple thing, but reacting to having the medium react to the idea was really profound in my mind. And I had not considered that at all. So trust your students. They sincerely have the most awesome ideas. Thank you.